Hello and welcome to White Fight, a conference on politics and ideology in militaries and armed groups, brought to you by the Center for War Studies of University College Dublin. I am Yanis Korsalakis, the lead organizer of this event, and the Marie Curie Fellow here at UCD. The purpose of this conference is to consider the ways in which particular sets of political ideas, values, or mentalities have shaped military practice over the 20th century. The talks you're about to watch have been pre-recorded by our participants and will remain available here in history. There are 12 papers in total organized in four thematic panels. Our speakers examine a broad range of topics from naval officers in the Russian Civil War to the use of paramilitaries by the Rhodesian government during Zimbabwe's War of Liberation. Professors Pierre Asselin and Junke Nigel will deliver keynote talks that will be recorded on the day of the conference and also made available in history. Our first panel examines the self-perception of soldiers and officers. Militaries are among the most secluded of communities. Their members are expected to adhere to certain sets of values that do not apply to the civilian population. Our papers in this session will examine how serving soldiers themselves have understood their place within the political communities that they defend. Our next speaker is Colin Gilmer. Colin recently defended his doctoral thesis on the ideological utility of hero culture in Nazi Germany. In this talk, he examines the symbolic role of decorations in the German military during the Second World War. Although historians of the Third Reich have noted the function of these awards as vessels of cultural capital signifying military virtue, they have tended to downplay their political and ideological weight within the context of the Nazi dictatorship. Colin takes a fresh look. Hello. My name is Colin Gilmore. Uh, let me face say first that I'm very excited to be taking part in this conference and naturally uh, I'll be under unique circumstances and naturally regret that we could not uh, be together uh, so I can meet my co-participants and listen to their talks. I'm very much encouraged and, uh, and excited to hear them. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll begin. Uh, for over five decades, military historians have sought to answer the question of how deeply and in what ways national socialist ideology penetrated the German military the Wehrmacht during the so-called Third Reich. This question has been debated by scholars including Manfred Messerschmidt, Johannes Hörter, Omar Bartov, Stephen G. Fritz, to name but a few, and has been analyzed from many different angles, be it exploring uh, the ideology of the elites who ran this famously conservative institution, the role of Nazism's prejudices in fueling soldiers' brutalization on campaign, or the role of positive ideas, so-called, in soldiers' worldviews, i.e. what they believed they were fighting for. My talk today uh, grows out of archival research conducted for my recent doctoral dissertation uh, and outlines my investigation of a potential new angle for this discussion and its ability to provide new insights and deeper levels of nuance uh, to the broader uh, discussion. Uh, namely, the symbolic role of war medals as vessels of ideology within the Wehrmacht during the Second World War. Now, military decorations have never found any meaningful place in this discussion to date, uh, and to me this represents something of a missed opportunity, uh, given the degree to which several recent sociocultural studies of the Wehrmacht by scholars including Christoph Rass, Felix Römer, and uh, our own keynote speaker, Dr. Neitzel, have demonstrated the importance of these objects in soldiers' everyday experience as symbols of self or group worth and identity, um, a status which many would go to great lengths to possess, I might add. Uh, the reason for this absence from the question, uh, for the, from the discussion, excuse me, is chiefly that for years, this sphere of military administration and culture has been considered one of the few areas largely devoid of political interference. Now, several authors have conceded that national socialist uh, regimes certainly wished for war medals to reinforce its ideological program, but have argued that continued dominance by a conservative leadership in the Wehrmacht, especially in the early years of the war, uh, effectively prevented this. The minimal presence of swastikas on most decorations, for example, is seen as aesthetic evidence of military authorities downplaying the presumptuous encroachment of Nazi ideology. Equally important, though, is that Wehrmacht officers and men have by and large been held to have shared this sentiment. They may have cared a great deal about who got what, uh, an interest Christoph Rass, for example, concedes is likely connected to pre-war influences of propaganda and youth organizations. However, he maintains that the award system's primary role was functional as an increasingly important system of incentives. It had little to do with Nazi national socialism and the regime's political agenda, and any service or disservice thereto was largely incidental. 
But over the next 20 minutes or so, I shall endeavor to remain within the timeline. Uh, I'd like to provide what amounts to a narrative snapshot uh, rooted in archival records from several branches of uh, German military administration and select ego document that challenged both of these conclusions. Uh, specifically, I argue that when viewed in concert with recent research on the wider usage of orders and decorations by the Nazis as vessels of political symbolism, we can see that award distribution in the Wehrmacht during the war represented a valued and heretofore underestimated means by which the narrative of that institution being a revolutionized one was to be showcased. Using the same contextual framework, uh, it also endeavors to highlight that even if not expressed politically, uh, or at least overtly politically, many soldiers aforementioned concerns over who got what represented and were received as a commentary on this political process and a measure of its success. Now to begin, research into Nazi Ordenspolitik or order politics is a relatively new field following pioneering work by Ralph Winkel uh, on the role of the famous Iron Cross Order as a vessel of symbolic capital uh, in and around the, second, the First World War. Scholars following in his footsteps have drawn attention to the fact that the NSDAP, as it was, uh, placed considerable stock in the value of such medals to gain moral credibility in the volatile political culture of the Weimar Republic. Benjamin Seaman, for example, has emphasized how the party placed importance in highlighting the number of war medals borne by its members, especially of the highest grades, like the famous Pour le Mérite, the Blue Max of Prussia, the best example being Hermann Göring. Thomas Weber, meanwhile, has expounded upon the well-known fact that Hitler in particular gained credibility through his receipt of the Iron Cross First Class. Um, indeed, more than that, he argues that it became an essential component in the growth of the subsequent Fuhrer myth surrounding his person. But even more important than this usage, though, was the Nazis' early utility for war medals as symbols of their nascent mythology of an egalitarian trench community during the war, and that in turn provided a blueprint for a future national community, a Volksgemeinschaft, uh, one personified by the archetypal Frontkämpfer, front fighter, the humble yet hardened infantryman. Now, the symbolic connection uh, between these two entities was predicated upon the collapse of the imperial award system through wartime inflation, and as many veterans alleged after the war, dishonorable distribution of medals to Etappenschweine, rear area pigs behind the lines, whose avaricious order hunting, Ordensiegen, was robbed, uh, that robbed Frontkämpfer of their just due. Now, Ralph Winkle, for example, has argued that this became hyperbolized and even amalgamated into the Nazis' wider stab in the back myth. Orden's politique, put simply, became an important tool in the symbolic arsenal of the party during its formative years and continued to be such even after it assumed power in 1933. And this has been chiefly uh, demonstrated in the creation of the Honor Cross of 1914 to 1918 and 1934 by the new Hitler government. As uh, the aforementioned Ralph Winkel and Gert Krumeich, for example, have argued, this medal was a response to pressure from war veterans determined to call uh, the new regime on its pledge to symbolically restore their allegedly lost honor. Now, the act met with widespread approval. Over 8 million Germans would, in fact, apply for this award over the next several years. And as such, it represented a major political victory, not only in allowing a consolidation of power in critical early years, but also symbolically demonstrating that the Third Reich was different and that the party kept its promises. It was an expression, in other words, of ideological fidelity. Moreover, it reaffirmed the benefits to be gained from the strategic usage of Ordenspolitik. And over the next five years, pre-war years, the party championed the creation of a vast system of new awards for virtually every facet of life in the new Germany. Now, this background is important for interpreting Hitler's actions on the first day of the Second World War, September 1st, 1939, when he inaugurated Nazi Germany's first uh, system of dedicated war medals. After years of minting new decorations, this system was quite small and seemingly anachronistic. Aside from reinstituting the 150-year-old Iron Cross order that he himself wore, the dictator did the same for a small number of other medals, including the wound badge, uh, which is uh, largely unchanged from, uh, especially aesthetically, from the First World War, except for the inclusion of a small swastika. And again, this 
continuity between first and second world war medals, at least at the outset, is seen as evidence of a lack of political interference in the military sphere. However, if viewed within an ordinance politique lens, uh, action, this action betrayed, it portrays itself as one, excuse me, one designed to demonstrate some ideal, the same ideological fidelity as the Honor Cross of 1934. On one hand, the medals themselves, chiefly the Iron Cross, were highly symbolic, connecting the new Wehrmacht with long traditions of German military egalitarianism. But more importantly, is that the small number of awards in the system and their eligibility was of a crucial political statement, that theoretically only combat soldiers could receive these new medals because only they could fit their eligibility, being the wound badge for being wounded in combat and the Iron Cross uh, for combat bravery. In context, the statement was this, this time around, Etappenschweine would not have access to the recognition justly deserved by Frontkämpfer. The new Germany would see to their just reward and their symbolic elevation as the elite of the Volksgemeinschaft. Now, acting on orders, propagandists, both military and civil, were quick to reinforce this ideological foundation. And it's worthwhile pointing out that this remained a theme in war propaganda about both medals and their recipients throughout the war, especially regarding the highest medals like the new Knight's Cross, which replaced the aforementioned Pour le Mérite. Now, among propagandists, none was more active or arguably effective in this regard than Josef Goebbels himself, the propaganda minister. Um, Goebbels personally sponsored the rise of Knight's Cross winners who personified uh, this medal's ideological meaning, or its intended meaning. The first and most important of these was Gunther Prien, uh, the submarine commander who famously sunk a British battleship at anchor in October 1939, a considerable naval coup for which he was given the Knight's Cross by Hitler. Prien was ideal for the role brave, young, and most importantly, from a humble background, beginning his career as a cabin boy in the Merchant Marine, a story that was soon publicized in an award-winning and ghost-written memoir entitled Mein Weg nach Scapa Flow, My Journey to Scapa Flow. As the war progressed, Goebbels also sought to systematize his efforts. His diary entries from September 1940, for example, attest to his efforts to create a special initiative to, quote, popularize Knight's Cross winners from the common people, unquote. Likewise, records of his daily propaganda, uh, propaganda conferences from the same period add that he petitioned military liaison officers for the creation of a general statistical index of the social origins of Knight's Cross winners to, quote, make apparent how social origin today is no longer critical, unquote. Within the Wehrmacht, though, it quickly became clear that the new system of awards and the ideology it stood for was not welcomed by all, namely those who had traditionally benefited from the class-defined value system or Wertsystem that had defined recognition within the imperial military. And the personification of this, at least in the first weeks of the war, was none other than the chief of the German Navy, Gross Admiral Erich Raeder. Although paying homage to the positive ideals of the party for Germany, Raeder was of the old school, steeped in the traditions of the Imperial Navy, and was quickly unsettled by the distribution of the new Knight's Cross to junior officers like Gunther Prien, fearing that it represented a wider threat to the proper order of recognition, which, of course, it did. Prien's mother would later write that from the moment her son had returned from his historic mission and received his medal, Raider had told him directly that he was unworthy of the Knight's Cross and derided him publicly as, quote, the little man from the Merchant Marine, unquote. Raider's concern, in fact, led him quickly by the beginning of 1940 to take the matter up directly with Hitler. In the records of one of their private naval conferences, um, we find evidence that Raider petitioned the dictator for the creation of a new award so that men like Preen would not receive the RK. The new award would be modeled on an imperial variant, which could thus preserve the established order. Now, Raider's oblique and ultimately unsuccessful attempt to protect uh, the conservative tradition he held dear from ideological interference highlights the important role of Hitler himself in directing the course of military awards. Though rarely acknowledged or uh, even remarked upon, uh, official records reveal that his role in this sphere was both intimate and active, as both uh, the commander-in-chief and the embodiment of Frontkämpfer ideology 
whose personal myth, as mentioned, was tied to the EK order, uh, the Iron Cross order, excuse me. Hitler's personal interest in keeping his system of medals ideologically pure made him the protector of national socialist values in this sphere, a self-appointed ideological chaperone, as it were. And this mission became obvious to all in July 1940. In a formal communique it's distributed to all military high commands in July, uh, Hitler declared that he had heard many utterances from the front regarding abuses of orders and decorations by Etappenschweine. Not literally using that word, but the, the essence of the same meaning. Angrily, he reminded readers that it was exactly to prevent this outcome that he, late in the previous year, had belatedly added another decoration to the award system, the War Merit Cross, or Kriegsverdienstkreuz, the KVK, designed to recognize non-combat merit and, in context, thus serving as a buffer between the EK and ideologically threatening order hunters. As such, several weeks later, the dictator decreed new measures to safeguard the symbolic purity of his beloved Iron Cross, namely ordering harsh restrictions on its awarding to staff officers and other non-combat personnel, the enemies of the Frontkämpfer in National Socialist mythology. Now, this act prompted a much greater response uh, and reaction than that of Erich Rader the previous year from within the upper echelons of the officer corps, known at the time as the Ordensfrage, or the Orders Debate. The new voice in this uh, movement was that of none other than the chief of the general staff, Franz Halder. Unlike Rader, Halder had no problem recognizing the little man, as it were, but bridled at the insult to his staff officers, traditionally the elite of the officer corps. Beginning with entries in his official war diary in 1940 with titles such as, quote, recognition for general staff officers smear campaign, unquote, he angrily rejected the notion inherent in Hitler's decree that such men were more susceptible to order hunting uh, or gaining awards undeservedly. Four months later, evidently having garnered enough courage to do so, he put his feelings in formal writing in a letter through uh, the army personnel office, albeit in more guarded tones. This eventually filtered up to Hitler himself, who addressed the issue head on at a meeting with his military chiefs at his residence on the Ober Salzburg on May 16th, 1941. At that meeting, Hitler sought to end the Ordensfrage by making clear that he would not compromise on his ideological agenda. He rejected the arguments posited by army leaders that intellectual preparations were adequate to be symbolically counted among Frontkämpfer. As an officer who would uniquely and repeatedly take issue with Hitler's military decisions during the war, Halder's open critique of what was clearly a political assault on conservative values is not necessarily remarkable. The fact that he, like Raider before him, chose to do so on the matter of award distribution, however, does underline the degree of symbolic significance attached to this process among conservative leaders as being a core manifestation of their values and military identity. At the same time, the Ordensfrage also underscores the degree to which the same leaders were unsuccessful at preventing such changes at a policy level, contrary to what scholars have written in the past. Finally, what is equi equally as noteworthy is Hitler's own willingness to sacrifice the goodwill of his elite staff officers on the eve of the war's most complex operation to date, the invasion of the Soviet Union, and thus the degree to which he held the symbolic sanctity of his award system of paramount importance. Indeed, correspondence between the Army Personnel Office, the HPA, and General Rudolf Schmundt, Hitler's chief adjutant, in September 1941, speak to the damage that was done. The dictator had certainly not wanted to create any divide, Schmundt had said, and regretted the divide that it had caused. Even so, he was not willing to budge one inch, and Schmundt said, as a result, relations between the Fuhrer headquarters and the army's staff was only limping along. The result of the Ordensfrage, moreover, soon became an even more bitter pill to swallow for both Hitler and Schmundt, his faithful acolyte, when only a few months later, at the same time that he was addressing the uh, aforementioned uh, results of that process, new reports emerged that it had been all been for naught. The fall of 1941 represented an important turning point of sorts. 
whereas most documentation prior to this date relates uh, regarding uh, controversies around, uh, surrounding the distribution of medals relate to the ideological struggle between Hitler and conservative leaders who felt the award system had gone too far. After this point, the focus very clearly shifts to Frontkämpfe themselves, specifically from the army who argued that it had not gone far enough, which of course in ideological terms was a far more serious problem. Contemporary records from the newly established Ordensgruppe, which was a unit specially tasked for this within the army and uh, the OKH, its headquarters, reported widespread discontent, particularly among the army's biggest uh, organization, the infantry. Ironically, the substance of these complaints was that war medals, chiefly the Iron Cross and the Knight's Cross, its highest grade, seemed to be going to those who didn't deserve them. Uh, and one can wonder if this was a case of deja vu for, for Hitler and Nazi leaders hearing this, or Schmund especially. In this case, uh, Etappenschweine were not only senior officers, staff officers, and other rear echelon officers, but other types of combat units whom infantrymen saw as softer, like fighter pilots, for example. One uh, letter included in a report from the Ordensgruppe from a General Friedrich Koch, commander of the 44th Army Group, dated October 20th, or, excuse me, August 20th, uh, mentioned that discontent was rife among his men who felt, quote, in no way appreciated, unquote, in the, in the, uh, the distribution of orders and decorations within the Wehrmacht as a whole. Likewise, a letter from a lieutenant in the 134th Infantry Division submitted to Schmundt criticized the headquarters' incorrect handling of war medals and their distribution and warned that unless remedied forthwith, there would be, quote, an indirect decomposition of fighting strength, unquote. Now, on one hand, as authors mentioned earlier have argued, individual soldiers' complaints are undoubtedly, in many cases, rooted in personal motivation, whether it be envy or a damaged sense of unit pride. Yet even if not framed in strictly political terms, nor at the leadership of Hitler himself, in the context of Ordenspolitik, such remarks represented a profoundly political statement, i.e. that the ostensibly new Wehrmacht was not the changed institution which its award system and supporting propaganda had promised. That Hitler's beloved Frontkämpfer believed as much was bad enough, but undoubtedly made worse by the fact that the results of an investigation conducted by the Ordensgruppe into the situation concluded that contrary to the dictator's efforts, there was a severe imbalance in award distribution, especially at the highest level, that ignored the unique spiritual and physical perspectives of Frontkämpfer and the infantry. What's more, investigation, this investigation made clear that this ideological heresy was rooted in the regime's own Ordenspolitik. Feelings of expectation and covetousness, the Ordensgruppe reported, created in the years before the war by the emphasis placed on war medals, could not be met because of the lack of flexibility within the new system, ironically, despite the creation of new buffer awards like the War Merit Cross. Adding insult to injury, the Ordensgruppe reported that the size of the imperial award system, that which had been fundamentally discredited by national socialist or, uh, propaganda, had been far better able to mitigate such problems. Unsurprisingly, the award system's self-appointed chaperone took the news badly, as it seems. Records of his famous table talk from November 1941 contain uh, a rant delivered to uh, unsuspecting dinner guests on the symbolic collapse of his award system, which Hitler blamed not on himself nor on Ordenspolitik more broadly, as the Ordensgruppe had diagnosed. Uh, but as per the party line, he blamed it on the greed and arrogance of the old elites. One note from Schmundt uh, to the Ordensgruppe even intimated that the dictator's frustration had even led him to consider discontinuing war medals altogether. Now, of course, he did not do so, and Hitler and Schmundt endeavored to reverse the damage done over the next two years, restoring the faith of Frontkämpfer that they were, in fact, fighting for the classless society that had been promised, led by men who did not forget their special place within it. So the following two years, as mentioned, featured a flurry of various measures which collectively served this end, most of which centering upon the most visible awards, the Knight's Cross being the chief. The uh, Ordensgruppe and the Army Personnel Office issued frequent memoranda to various headquarters, which mandated that orders and decorations be distributed uh, and reformed to suit, quote, foundational principles, unquote. 
February 1942, shortly after the Ordens, uh, sorry, the recent complaints from Front Kempfer, uh, the Ordens Group ordered a special leveling of award recommendations, condemned selfishness among senior officers, and accused them of rejecting junior officers and enlisted men's award recommendations if they themselves had not already possessed it. Likewise, Hitler himself oversaw the creation of a series of new awards, be it medals, badges, cuff titles, etc., which all served to highlight combat merit, especially within the infantry. Chief among this was the Close Combat Badge, the Nahkampfspange, created by Hitler himself in 1942, and which, according to Rudolf Schmundt's war diary, was meant to become the ultimate decoration for the infantrymen beneath the Knight's Cross. Finally, Hitler himself aided in renewed propaganda drives to reaffirm, reaffirm his award system's true meaning. In one of his final public speeches at the Berlin Sportspalast in September 1942, for example, he proclaimed that in seeing the recipients of the Knight's Cross, one saw a cross-section of German society. You see the common man next to the private first class, he said, the non-commissioned officer alongside the sergeant major with the lieutenant and the general. This was proof, he went on, that the social structures, the old social structures, had been replaced by a society established by blood in which there was only one standard of value. It's worth noting that at precisely the same time, a ban was issued to the German press not to publish statistical surveys of the awardings of the highest war medals. Now, unfortunately for Hitler and Schmundt, by mid 1943, it had become clear that this renewed attempt had failed to regain soldiers' confidence. Once again, we were referring to the Schmundt War Diary, voices from the front were once again decrying the lack of proper recognition that deserved by Frontkämpfer compared to their officers and other less worthy branches. What's more, many rejected some of the new awards as the placations that they were, lacking both physical and symbolic value. Undoubtedly, because of his own efforts to rectify this situation, Schmundt was evidently incensed by these complaints, so much so that he took the time to personally respond to an angry letter from a senior Lieutenant Behrmann, included as part of an army-wide survey asking for ideas about new forms of recognition. In a memoranda dated September 17, 1943, Schmundt answered Behrmann's allegations point by point, and his claim that the common infantrymen had been cast aside in favor of more glamorous, prestigious figures. The order system was not, was not fully equal, Schmundt granted, but such allegations were unfair given that imbalances were not what they had been in 1941. And moreover, the fault lay with men's own corrupt commanding officers, not with himself, his office, or his master. The latter, meanwhile, similarly faced this failure with a level of embitterment uh, and frustration. After meeting with Hitler almost at the same time as Schmundt's letter, uh, Josef Goebbels would remark in his diary that, quote, the Fuhrer considers it very difficult, if not out of the question, to allocate orders and decorations fairly, and that elevating the common Frontkämpfer in this was extraordinarily so. Defeated for the second time, the remainder of the war saw only half-hearted repeats of the previous year's attempts at reforms and targeted propaganda. Yet such, award, such efforts, of course, had come far too late, for by now, Frontkämpfer had perhaps their most damning evidence of neglect and unmet promises. In terms of the rising number of military awards, even the Iron Cross and Wound Badge, sacred emblems of the Frontkämpfer, being distributed to civilians on the home front as a result of Allied bombing. One report from the secret police, the Sicherheitsdienst, or SD, from June 1944, notes that soldiers on leave who witnessed this were often livid. It was bad enough that a Tappenschweiner among their own ranks were receiving their awards. Now even their children were doing so. Some even put blame directly at Hitler's feet. Hadn't the Fuhrer not said that, quote, no one in the homeland can accomplish so much as the brave soldiers at the front, unquote. It was in this spirit that Germany ended the war with a bloated and ideologically dysfunctional system of military medals, a fate captured succinctly by State Secretary Otto Meisner, the head of the presidential chancellery, in a letter to Goebbels in November 1944, that, quote, after beginning the war with so few decorations, the Reich now had so many that few could keep track of them and even fewer know their meaning. Uh, as mentioned uh, at the beginning of this paper, uh, in this overview of what I think is a, a substrata of a much wider discussion, 
in reopening the often overlooked aspect of Wehrmacht history in orders and decorations, I believe we can find a new perspective with which to study and assess the role and treatment of Nazi ideology within that institution. As evidenced here, albeit cursorily with uh, an overview of a much wider body of evidence, um, the Wehrmacht's politically charged system of symbolic awards represented not only a valued ideological conduit, the one in which that Hitler made possible to enforce, but also one that was part of probably its least effective ever. From the, this perspective, what had begun as a streamlined system as a, with a clear message ended up achieving precisely the opposite effect, becoming a lightning rod of sorts, which showcased the unrevolutionized nature of the new military and alienating parts of the very demographic it had been meant to attract. In tracing this latter failure, moreover, we also gain a perspective on how this effort influenced the outlook of various groups within the Wehrmacht, be it conservative or frontkämpfer. Among common soldiers, especially the years 1941 to 1943, highlight the degree to which years of Nazi Ordenspolitik before the war had both infused and shaped their attitudes towards broader questions of status, honor, and social order. Last of all, in exploring this largely undervalued topic, I think we can find opportunities for new research questions to further nuance the discussion of ideology in the Wehrmacht, such as the consequences of awarding for medals to foreigners during the war, thus in violation of Nazi party and the Nazis' racial ideology, or the effectiveness of war medals on the home front, which, as mentioned, was most of all a violation of the, four, the core principles of Frontkämpfer ideology. Uh, with that, I look forward to hearing your questions and comments on February 20th, uh, and thank you very much.